आराध्य देव की चौड़ में वंदना परम पुज गुरुदेव की चौड़ में वंदना टीचर्स नेहरू भाई एंड टूडे इज माई टॉपिक इज कनेक्टिंग पॉइंट ऑफ बॉडी एंड सोल Um, I want to start my talk that this universe is comprised of two entities, soul and non-soul. One entity contains life, and other is non-living or lifeless. The living being is conscious, while the non-living body is without consciousness. Some schools of philosophy in the West. and the chava philosophy in india accept that only the physical or non living self as what is real the dina the very existence of the soul but according to them they are uh, telling that it drink, drink and be merry is that motto in chava philosophy it say यस्मात्मी You should do whatever you want to do. So some philosophy believes in this thing, but there are other philosophies that propose a completely different dynamic. That the soul has an independent existence. How do we account for these two fundamentally different schools of thought? Those who accept the mind. contains all known reality do not acknowledge knowledge that consciousness extends beyond what we physically perceive they reject any theory of consciousness beyond their personal understanding which is limited at best fortunately those who do not limit their acceptance of reality to the corporeal have a wider understanding of consciousness there are two forces there are two forces at work in this paradigm first is adhyavasaya and second is chitta so what is adhyavasaya adhyavasaya it means conscious and ajur prime drives and chit is side of conscious mind the chitta the conscious in nature chitta is a consciousness in nature but it addresses the corporeal or physical body whereas adhyavasa extends consciousness consciousness beyond the body adhyavasa is a field of conscious vibration working with karmic energy your conscious vibrations from the soul cause the field of kasha and passion after coming out the vibrations affected by the kasha form of pain which is called adhyavasa when our conscious energy extends to adhyavasa our body is left behind kasha is the impulses of delusion which stain the consciousness with its own color in other words kasha is the malevolent energy because of attachment and aversion it is four fold consisting of anger ego deceit and greed and whenever any activity is done at the physical mental or verbal level bias by attachment or aversion the soul attracts an auspicious karma this karma forms a field of kasha stays there for a certain time and then is shed 
Here we can discuss about two stages of trauma. First is the rising stage and second is cessation. So what is rising, rising stage of karma? So rising karma leaves its effect on the conscious vibration passing through this field. In this case, the Advaivasai also becomes malvolent and hence its manifestation at the physical level is harmful. The second term is cessation. So cessation is threefold. Subsidence, subsidence come in destruction and total destruction. And technical, technical terms of uh, Jainism, we can say Uksham, Kshayoksham, and Kshay. So, all, in all three stages, karma is ineffective. If there is cessation of karma in any form, the conscious vibrations passing through the field of Kshay. Do not get affected and hence stay pure. Once you can see, the Asya Vasa is pure and at physical level, the thought, attitude, or behavior is also pure. So now uh, we'll talk about Asya Vasa. What is Asya Vasa? So Asya Vasa is a being, uh, it is a subtle in nature. So it is beyond the perception of common man, but it connects the soul and body. Spiritual leaders consider the body and soul to be to distinct, uh, distinct entities. So now here question is arises: If body and consciousness, body and soul, both are different. How they are related? What is the point where the body and consciousness come together? This is a complex question that must consider the physical, the spiritual, and the many points of understanding in between. So let's approach this a little differently. Here, we can say that the soul, our soul, is the nuclear, the center, which is conscious. And it is surrounded by the field of kasha. Like uh, I want to share. Here, uh, this is a circle. You can say this is our soul. Okay? This is the center nucleus. And then, here, there is a circle of kasha, which is affecting. So, first, in center nucleus, which is conscious, is a soul. This is a soul. And then so it is surrounded by field of kasha, and which is harmful to the soul. In Jainism, we are many times we hear in our armas that thank you. This is like soul. Then this is the circle of kasha and when this kasha is very powerful so it can be harmful for our soul it rules over the soul as a matter of fact the soul is potentially the most powerful because of because it is pure and but kasha becomes more powerful and dominant dominates the soul when they are doing this they are hiding its purity so the pure conscious energy always has to pass through the domain of impulses impure kasha so from the kasha the conscious energy enters to the next orbit 
This is a uh, next orbit. We have next orbit, and it is the next orbit of the. And so we can say it's a bioelectric body or in gen terminology, Tejas cell. The third, this is a Tejas cell. So Tejas cell gives energy to the field of Adyavasha. Now, the Tejas cell is a field of, we can say, field of uh, Adyavasha. The first was the soul, then Tasha. And then Adyavasha. And the Adyavasha, it's a, the system works actually with Tejasari or bio, or we can say bioelectric body. The Tejasari gives energy to fill up Adyavasha. And Adyavasha is more important than the mind. Generally, we are giving importance to our mind, but Adyavasha is more important than the mind. It is not your mind that makes you good or away. Positive or negative. Pure and pure. It is Adyavasa. Maybe you feel that it's uh, something odd. When we listen to this, we think, feel that it is odd. But yeah, Adyavasa is everything. A lay person cannot understand this. Only one who has realized himself can estimate the value of Adyavasa. Adyavasa is the point where the consciousness and the body can be experienced separately and the relation between the two can be understood. In mundane life the, and worldly activities, it is hard to experience the existence of Adyavasa, whereas the mind is easy to recognize. That is why the mind is easily accepted. Mind is accepted in every philosophy, so it's very easy to accept it, but very tough to accept that Adyavasa. And the domain of the mind is unique. The mind is not found in every living being. It exists only in human beings and in intellectually developed animals. Uh, in Jain terminology, terminology, I can say Sangi Tiyaj Panchengi, who has, they have mind. But Adyavasha, when we talk in the other hand, Adyavasha is found in all living beings, including plants also. So it is believed that all living beings from one sense being, like plants to five sense being, like humans, they are subject to the bonds of karma. A being with mind certainly attracts karma, but so do living beings without a mind. And in Jain canonical, canonical literature, Sutra Kitam, the second canonical text of Jainism, Lord Mahavira explains that this is a very interesting way. When Akchi, the mundane soul, attracts karma because of its actions, But when one goes to sleep at night, one conscious mind in, in actual, the person is in such deep sleep that he cannot even dream. Yet he is attracting and bonding karma. This is important because it is believed that only an active state of mind is responsible for bonding karma. But here we see that even when you are in a deep and dreamless sleep, where conscious activity is impossible, karma enters the body. And if a person has power, reason, or wrong perspective, he is attracting negative karma in the form of any one of 18 sins described in Jainism. 18 sins, Atharapa. And when when disciple of Lord Mahavira heard this, he asked Lord Mahavira, Bhante, how is it possible that a sleeping man can draw karma? Lord Mahavira explained this with a two examples. He explained with two examples. 
that to the first example, the most significant when we are uh, discussing about connecting points of body and soul. So it's uh, the first point is very important. How uh, any living beings, if he is in sleep, he can even attack the karma. So first example was that a plant has a life but neither mind or no speech, right? So it only has a body which is in a constant state sleep. It's a constant in a state of sleep, deep sleep. So the consciousness of such an existence is forever dormant. Plants do not possess mental faculties yet they are attracted to eating native karma. So how does this happen? Lord Mahavira explained that this happens through the Adhyavasa as plants have innumerable expressions of Adhyavasa. The expressions of Adhyavasa may be benevolent or malevolent. Malevolent expression, it means uh, action of violence, possessiveness, anger, greed, pride, deceit, and the like. So, Malevolent expression is responsible for karmic bondage, and the plant plants possess all these negative expressions and emotions. These beings do not have a mind or speech, but they do have instincts, feelings, and sensations, which causes them to unite with karma. Based on our, our knowledge of physical the brain, mind, and speech hold the highest place in the context of knowledge, but the greatest source of knowledge in the subtle world is Adhyavasa. According to physical science, the cell is the smallest unit that helps us to know self deliver the same knowledge transmitted by Adhyavasa. The lowest life forms which have neither mind the same. So, so, sorry for disturbance. We are talking about the Adhyavasa, and according to physical science, the cells is the smallest unit that helps us to know. Cells deliver the same knowledge transmitted by Adhyavasa. The lowest life forms, which have neither mind nor brain, and know the world through cells. Now science says that the seeds in plants are more sensitive than those in human beings. Why are plants more sensitive if they do not have a mind? This is the question. So, uh, most important question that why are the plants more sensitive if they, are not, if they do not have a mind? It is because of Adhyavasa only. In plants, Adhyavasa is directly transformed into sensation. So they are more likely to have the capacity of recognition, memory, and understanding others' feeling. If you have heard ever, ever before, a uh, well-known scientist, Dr. Cleve Baxter, has performed a number of experiments on the such a behavior of plants. One experience, uh, experiment was the particularly telling an, its outcome. The experiment began with two plants located in an empty room. Six volunteer participants and one sheet of paper. He divided the paper into six pieces. On one of the pieces, he wrote one of two plants and the room will be pulled from its pot 
and crushed. The remaining five chiefs were blank. Then he separately folded all six pieces of paper and put them on the table and left the room. Next, he put a blank fold over the eyes of six volunteers before they entered the room. They were each told to pick up one of the folded papers and asked to follow the instructions on the paper if there were any written. Uh, now, uh, none of them knew that uh, what was written on the seats. The volunteer who had picked up the paper with the written statement followed through as instru instructed. He pulled one of the plants out of the pot from its root and began to drive the, it, it apart. Afterward, all the participants left the room. Then a polygraph machine was connected to the remaining plant. Now, what did the doctor backstairs? He asked the six participants to re-enter the room. He was uh, wanted to know that what happens with the other plants. And to this point, he was completely unaware which person had uprooted the plant. So each participant was asked to stand briefly next to the remaining plant to see if there was any uh, detectable reaction from the plant. Five of the volunteers stood next to the plant without eliciting, eliciting a response detectable. So there was no response on polygraph. And now, however, as the last person approached the plant, a very noticeable response was detected by the polygraph. Substantially different from the other responses. The plant recognized that this person had destroyed the other plant and was frightened of him. This proves that plants have and to team attributes that are not available or readily accessible to humans. Dr. Baxter performed a second experiment too, and it was also with other plants. Again, a polygraph machine was connected to the number of plants. While he was in the room with the plants, he thought of setting fire to the plants. As soon as he focused on the, this thought, the pointer of the polygraph started to move. The pointer was showing that apprehension of the plant based on his thoughts. As long as he kept thinking the same thought, the polygraph indicated the fear experienced by the plants. He got up and went outside. Abruptly, he changed his mind and returned to the room with a positive feeling and moved close to the plants with the thought of not hurting them. The effect was amazing. There was no movement in the pointer. The plants were at ease. Men cannot read each other's minds, but plants seem to do so. How do we explain this? What has plants sense so strongly? It seems that there are attributes of knowing that are beyond the abilities of mind. The mind is not the foundation or source of knowledge. The source of knowledge is Adhivasa. It is the origin of all sensation. Man approaches this understanding from the opposite direction, ignoring the adhyavasa and viewing the mind as source of all knowledge. Adhyavasa is the main source of knowledge. So now, the soul or consciousness at the center, again we discussed that, that what is, the, how many uh, circles are there or how many
So we just uh, discussed about that the soul or consistence at the center and surrounded by the field of kosha, right? The field of adhivashan or conscious energy is next. First is the uh, this first is the soul, then kosha, and then adhivasha. And uh, after this uh, uh, adhivasha, the thing that uh, we can say that in this level, the physical body has no function. Excuse me. Sorry for this one. Um, so, so, till this level, the physical body has no function. Only the karmic body and Tejas Shari have control over the all the spirits. The karmic and bio electric uh, electric bodies have no limbs neurological network or brain. There is no spinal cord. There is not a single means to a center of knowledge. Yet, uh, they are capable of cognition. You might wonder what the significance of such bodies is. This such a body have knowledge, not in the sentient sense, but through Adhyavasai. Since Adhyavasai has conscious power, it has the potential to know. This knowledge does not require organs or physical fa faculties. It can access knowledge without the help of the physical body uh, and is the better border between physical and non-physical function. After this film, knowledge through the physical body comes into effect. When impulses or vibrations come out of the field of Adhivashan, they enter the domain of Corporea. So now, after the Adhivasa, one more orbit is there. So when impulses appear at the physical level, the physical body gets connected with the soul. Okay, this means that the vibrations inside start getting sensed at the physical level. Now it started here on the physical level. Okay, so the main work of conscious vibrations is formation of chitta. So what happens here? Here, since uh, like here the formation of Chitta. Chitta respect of the self or consciousness as the bridge between the physical body and the soul. Sorry, uh, because of technical uh, issues, uh, I, my presentation become stuck. So I have to share like this. So first is a this is the first. It is a soul. Okay, and then the second is a field of uh, kasha or karma. Okay. 
okay and then third one is a pillow of adyavasha this third one is a pillow of adyavasha this side and the port now the port when we enter in the port it is a pillow of lesha or emotion so what happens here the chit the representative of the self consciousness and it's a uh, you can say it's a bridge between the physical and physical body and the soul so what happens here that it controls all mental physical and vocal actions and the chit is created with the help of the brain at this level knowledge is manifested through the organs of physical body here of course knowledge needs the functionally functionality of the body and uh, for its reflection so chit enables true knowledge of an object then this adyavasha projects radiations which moves outward in every direction it's not necessary that it will be in only one direction it uh, that uh, adyavasha can go from any direction every direction so what happens here that it is said that adyavasha has innumerable centers the number of atoms in adyavasha is equal to the number of point of the space so then after this ripples of impulses enter the domain of chitta after uh, this adyavasa at the, the fourth stage chitta it is a it uh, enters here domain of chitta we can say chitta or the uh, emotions or lesions all that things are there so uh, when it enters the here uh, in the chitta and there they flow like an electromagnetic wave of impulses and enter the domain of lesha okay now what happens here adyavasha then chitta and when it enters the chitta then it enters the domain of lesha so lesha literally meaning color lesha is a, it has a literally meaning of meaning that color and is a technical term in jain philosophy it is expression of uh, we can say it's, it is the expression or we can say it's a flow of karma and uh, each lesha there are six types of lesha so lesha is drawn by karma and endowed with certain colors depending on the past deeds and uh, being projected so this is where incoming waves interact with the colors atoms resulting in instincts and impulses all impulses both good and bad originate in the field of lesha precession of karma leads to the good impulses and rising karma begets negative impulses so in other word we can say that uh, uh, electromagnetic waves are colored as they are affected by karma now the adyavasa interacts with the endocrine system in the form of ultra microwaves and then the compulsive forces produced by the interaction of adyavasha and lesha are finally projected through the body so on the physical plane uh, the manifestation of karma are transmitted through the endocrine system so this is the output of karma is through the chemical messages messengers uh, uh, who know as hormones the quality of this hormones is in and uh, we can see it's uh, uh, in the echo accordance uh, with the intensity of past karma so consequently karmic expression through the hormones controls the physical body the brain has no role in karmic manifestation up to this point the field of adyavasha and the field of lesha affects our operational system thought speech and muscular action combine to make up the faculty 
of uh, executive system. It uh, on this system implies that the mind is part of an operational system and is not the source of knowledge. So me, uh, we can see some uh, uh, most important uh, thing about the Jainism that it says that the source of knowledge is Atyavasha, not the mind. So the mind is not responsible uh, for attracting karma, nor it is capable of destroying karma. It merely follows instruction as issued from within the self. Speech to executes uh, the instructions initiated from within. So similarly, the body is not the blame. Uh, we cannot blame the body for attracting karma. These three bodily components, mind, body, and speech, are responsible for physical and mental actions or speech. Um, or mental uh, free execution, but uh, it is not simply for the sake of knowledge itself. The domain of knowledge ends at the domain of chitta, and the domain of emotions ends with the domain of lesha. So uh, the our emotions are related to our lesha and. Uh, Uh, and uh, uh, knowledge is uh, related to chitta and adhyavasha. So, what happens here? Then how um, um, we can say that how that uh, here we, uh, we have question how do the knowledge and emotions move forward and get manifested at the physical level, right? So they have uh, modalities of expressions which should manifest on the physical plan to the mind, speech and body. The function of the mind is to recall, to think. And to imagine what it will recall, it will recall past, what it will think, it will think about present, and what it will imagine, it will imagine about the future. So, in the world of science and technology, these are seemingly, seemingly uh, we can say, mundane process, processes. And uh, these functions can be cruel. Um, Oh, but, uh, we can uh, compare it uh, the, uh, this function we can compare it with robots or computers what then is the uh, it's the like a uh, utility of mind when we are saying that adhyavasha and chitta are all thing not mind is doing there anything so what what is the uh, utility of mind or more importantly, we can uh, ask the question that is there a substantial difference between the mind and the computer? Uh, I think that there is not much difference between the two. A computer works in much the same way as a phys physical mind or brain. Right? So, to an extent, we can say that uh, the mind and the computer hold equal standing. The critical distinction is the difference in the creator of each. The mind is the creation of karmic body and the computer is the creation of men. So the karmic body is an all-powerful and supremely intelligent entity which could fab, uh, fabricate the micro parts of the uh, physical body. The creative genius man falls in the comparison with his ability to uh, replicate the abilities of the ultra micro body. So, man has been the architect of many physical models, but he can never be an arch architect of the human body, nor has he or will see uh, he designed um, and build a system as complicated as the new, um, we can see now, our brain. 
So it is true that a computer can memorize, say, vast amounts of information. It can solve many functions. It can solve mathematical uh, interrelated data, just as the brain does. If you focus only on capabilities of the mind, then there is no difference between the mind and computer. Now let us uh, analyze this differently. The mind is a part of executive system of sorts. It can be, it can, sorry, it can not be categorized as a good or bad. The owner or master is responsible for the good or, or the bad or, uh, as it is uh, he um, who and initiates the process. So if when the mind is signaled to process information, it does so. It is not responsible for the quality of outcome. Unfortunately, the mind is deemed as the center of any outcome because it is a functionary. While the owners, uh, the adhyavasa and the chitta, remain obscure. The mind has to face the reaction like the ambassador to a king the victim of anger if he delivers an unfavorable message. So, uh, so when uh, we think about the anti idea, consciousness or the self-forming nucleus of the living organism is at the center surrounded by contaminant orbit of Prussia and at the external level uh, outermost orbit is yoga. The mind is never static or constant. It goes into action as directed by the individual. The mind is the product of the process of the individual. In fact, if you attract the atoms of force to the mind, you are uh, that uh, in the technical terms of uh, Jainism, Manovarya, Pudgala Manovarya. So when you uh, attract the atoms of thought to the mind, you are pro procreating the mind. If you do not wish to attract these atoms to the mind, the mind and its uh, thinking process will not come into effect. You will be a thoughtless state. The activation of speech works in the same way. The body works differently, obviously, because uh, we got the body by birth and we can't lack it. If we lack, we die. So the body is ready to act as soon as it is connected to the conscious self. Ultimately, it is, uh, we can say that it's uh, up to you to initiate thoughts or actions. The potentially, uh, potentiality of uh, action is there, but um, it's execution depends on your will. Go deep into yourself and understand the underlying secret. The secret is to be aware. Be aware of your mind, your speech and your body to keep them away from external influence. So this is, uh, you can see this uh, awareness will not allow any external situation to dominate uh, dominate the cell, thus enabling a healthy execution of our mental and physical process. If the execution system is healthy, it can deny any negative instructions that might arise. So for example, um, sometimes the master has to do favors for the employee in order to keep him happy and to get the work done properly. In the same manner, keep your execution system under your control. Make sure the execution system does not have control of the adhyavasa and you will reach the first step towards purity, the process of controlling negative energy. The process of eliminating karmic energy is quite different from that uh, of controlling it. So, uh, we will discuss, we can discuss it later in any other class, but for now let's uh, consider the process of control. There are three steps. 
perception of breathing. You can perceive your breath, your breathing. And then the second step is perception of physical body. You can perceive your the physical body, each and every part of your body. And then third one is the perception of psychic colors. So when we perceive the psychic colors, it's a uh, uh, terminology of preksha, and we can say uh, swas preksha, sharir preksha, and lesha dhan. So when uh, we are doing this, colors are very important. The lesha dhan is the color pre, uh, psychic colors. Those colors are very important for us. And we do color meditation to attract the positive colors from the cosmos and to develop purity. So first, uh, I want to come, uh, conclude my speech. First, make your mind, body, and speech positive by following negative instruction over and over. Mind, body, and speech have become habitu habituated uh, to being negative. So it is a, a natural phenomenon. When a person gets angry, his eyebrows are knitted together. His eyes turn red and uh, he, his lips start to quicker and his body begins to shake. Some people are good at uh, feigning uh, anger. Even in the absence of anger, they pretend to be angry. And often the physical expression of anger allows the emotion to come up in our thoughts. So the very first step to pay attention to the habits of uh, nerve, the mind, and speech. So, if these are we enough to be domine, uh, dominated by external influences, work on controlling them, and changing habit, and uh, filling them of outer influences. The second step is to keep your mind, body, and speech away from inner instructions. Do not let the instruction reach them. Here, inner instruction means the instructions of kasha. Right? So, destroy the emotional desire to respond before these emotions meet your executive system. When these two processes, the process of controlling and the process of eliminating, work together with your other spiritual practices, the spiritual journey is uplifting and you will be successful in achieving your goal. So, uh, this is the, you can say, this is the connecting point of our body and soul. So, first is the, in the center, our soul, then uh, the next is the field of kasha, then the field of adhyavasha, and then the next uh, orbit is the field of lesha, emotions. Then our endocrine system, then our nervous system, then the mental system, and the last one is the muscular system. So I think you could understood, you can understood, understand the topic. And now I want to come through. I think Pataji is also there. Next speaker. Thank you.